As much as you might want to think that Lucifer, Beelzebub, Leviathan, and all the other top demons that are known today are the most ancient demons in the Bible, I beg to differ in this video. By some definitions, demons are wicked spirits. They are spiritual entities, as opposed to humans, who have bodies. You probably already know that angels and devils are mentioned in the Bible if you are familiar with it. Most of us would be surprised to find that there isn't a single verse in the entire Bible that describes how demons came to be, though. Most Christians hold that demons are fallen angels who left heaven before Adam and Eve were seduced and were banished there with Satan, the devil. But guess what? The Bible does not have a story like this. In reality, the only instance in which something akin to angels turning into demons is mentioned is in Revelation 12 verse 9, but the entire incident occurred at the birth of the world savior, Revelation 12 verses 4 to 6, which occurred long after Adam and Eve were created. The concept of an angelic fall from grace actually has its roots in church tradition and the epic poem Paradise Lost by the great English poet John Milton. If the Bible doesn't reference an early expulsion of heaven by a large number of angels who later transformed into demons, then where do the monsters come from? The answer to this question is probably extremely straightforward, although you've probably never heard of it, according to ancient Jewish writings like the Dead Sea Scrolls, demons are the disembodied spirits of the enormous Nephilim who perished during the period of the Great Flood. However, that is not the conclusion of the story nor is that what this video is all about. The most ancient demons, which include more than simply Nephilim, are the ones I'm going to tell you about in this video. Don't be misled by the previous Dead Sea Scrolls narrative. Strong linkages in the biblical text exist that, at least to us, are not immediately evident but yet support the demon origin theory. An ancient reader who lived during the time of the Bible would have found this explanation to be quite simple. Returning to the Bible's account of the Great Flood can help us comprehend what they witnessed. The Nephilim, the sons of God, and the Mesopotamian Apkalu. The Flood story in the first four verses of the Bible says that as people began to populate the planet and had daughters, the sons of God saw how lovely the human daughters were and any was chosen by them to be their wife. Because a man is created of flesh, the Lord then said, My spirit shall not abide in man for an eternity, his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim existed both then and subsequently when the sons of God had relationships with human women and had children by them. These were the mighty, storied men of old. Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. The sons of God, more commonly known as angels, violate the divinely ordained division between heaven and earth by procreating with human women. These children are referred to as Nephilim. Giants, not demons, are referred to as Nephilim. For the purposes of this video, we will focus on the recent discovery of new evidence in ancient cuneiform, the wedge writing on clay tablets known from ancient Mesopotamia, that provides glaring parallels to Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 that validate what I'm presenting, and explain why this strange story was included in the flood story. The supernatural beings known in Mesopotamian religion as Apkalu are the main subject of the Mesopotamian flood tale. The Apkalu imparted heavenly knowledge to the human race. They are credited with providing the Mesopotamian people with the wisdom required for the advancement of human civilization. The great deity determined that humans were just too noisy and bothersome and deserved to be wiped off, so the Apkalu came up with a plan to preserve the spiritual wisdom humanity would require. They fathered children with human women. The quasi-divine beings known as Apkalu who survived the deluge and restored civilization served as proof that the plan was effective. They were the influential people whose expertise and exploits helped make cities like Babylon famous. These second-generation Apkalu were described as giants in the Mesopotamian epics in addition to being divine-human hybrids. Gilgamesh is possibly the most well-known illustration. He is referred to as the Lord of the Apkalu in a cuneiform inscription on a little clay seal. 
please don't miss the point. The biblical and Mesopotamian stories both include supernatural entities mating with human women and producing gigantic progeny. The spiritual dads and their huge offspring are both referred to as Apkalu in the cuneiform literature. By the way, as a protection against evil spirits, archaeologists have discovered monuments to the Apkalu hidden in boxes in the foundations of the walls. The boxed Apkalu is also referred to by the Mesopotamian title Matsseri, which means watchers. What does this have to do with demons, you might think? It's unusual and intriguing, but it's also theology, which is the answer to problems like these. Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 was written by Israelites known as Anakims, also known as the Rephames, Deuteronomy 2 verse 11, who wished to make the point that the Apkalu before the flood were not good people. They did something bad, and the huge offspring Apkalu that were produced as a result of their wrongdoing became enemies of the true God of heaven. In fact, their gigantic offspring were determined to wipe out Israel many years later. Later in biblical history, particularly under the leadership of Moses and Joshua, the Israelites came into conflict with tribes of very huge warriors known as the Anakim. In Numbers 13 verse 32 to 33, it is made clear that the Anakim were a branch of the Nephilim. The Emim, the Zamzumim, and the Rephaim were further names for the huge clans, Deuteronomy 2-3. Joshua summed up the conquest as follows, there were no Anakim remaining in the territory of the Israelites. The eradication of these huge Anakim was necessary for the land conquest warfare. In Ashdod, Gath, and Gaza, only a few remained. The Philistines lived in these three cities. One of the cities during David's reign, Gath, would give birth to Goliath, 1 Samuel 17 verse 4. The term, Rephaim, holds the key to understanding how these giants were perceived as demons in Jewish works produced after the Old Testament, in the biblical substance notion that got substantial attention. The Rephaim are portrayed to as massive warlords in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 2 verses 8 to 11, Joshua 13 verse 12, but they are also characterized as terrifying, dangerous disembodied spirits, sometimes known as the shades in the underworld, or Sheol in Hebrew, Isaiah 14 verse 9. The ghostly shapes of the giants became associated with the afterlife, which everyone feared, as a result of everyone's fear of death. The Rephaim, however, had a horrible extra link. In the Old Testament, the Valley of the Rephaim is mentioned about ten times, 2 Samuel 5 verse 18. The Valley of the Rephaim was located close to the Valley of Hinnom, also known as the Valley of the Son of Hinnom, according to Joshua 15 verse 8 and 18 verse 16. The Hebrew word for the Valley of Hinnom, which is transcribed as G.E. Hinnom, is the source of the name Gehenna, which is primarily associated with Hades or Hell in the New Testament, tying the narratives together. Most Christian thinkers throughout the history of Christianity have been unaware of this supernatural backdrop, unlike the generation of Jews who lived immediately after the Old Testament period, which academics refer to as the Second Temple period or, more commonly, the Intertestamental period. Books like One Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls were both authored at this time. In addition to being referred to be angels in the Book of One Enoch, the demonic sons of God mentioned in Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 are also known as watchers. The relationship to the Mesopotamian Apkalu is transparent and clear. According to one Enoch, the watchers and their offspring were the origin of demons. When people began to have children, it so happened that they had daughters who were both lovely and gorgeous. The angels, who are the children of heaven, responded by saying to one another, Come, let us choose wives for ourselves from among the daughters of man and beget us children. After selecting a woman for each of them separately, they took wives for themselves and began approaching them. Michael, Shurafel, and Gabriel then observed intently from above as a great deal of blood was spilt on the earth and a great deal of persecution was brought about. 
Women gave birth to giants in such large numbers that there was oppression and bloodshed all throughout the world as a result. In addition, the dead will bring their clothing to the heavenly gate as we watch the Holy One weep. Despite their groans ascending to heaven, they were unable to flee from the oppression being inflicted on earth. The Lord gave Gabriel the order to proceed against the bastards and reprobates and against the children of adultery, and destroy the children of adultery. Bind them under the rocks of the earth for seventy generations, until the day of their judgment and of their culmination, until the end of the eternal judgment, after they and all their children have fought among themselves, after they have seen their loved ones destroyed. However, giants made via the combination of spirits and flesh will now be known to be bad spirits on the planet because they will reside on and within the earth. Evil spirits have possessed their bodies. They became known as the Watchers on the day they were formed from the Holy Ones because their primary genesis is spiritual in nature. On earth, they will turn bad. Several Dead Sea Scrolls refer to demons as bastard spirits, and one Enoch also describes the giants in this way. One a non-biblical psalm found among the Dead Sea Scrolls refers to demons as the disembodied spirits of the divine human offspring from Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4. Demons are also referred to as man's children and the Holy One seed. I'll simply touch on one of the many branches that make up the New Testament's demon explanation. The watchers whose wickedness gave rise to devils were to be imprisoned for seventy generations beneath the ground's rocks, according to the text from 1 Enoch. This idea is backed by Peter's claim in 2 Peter 2 verses 4-5 that when angels erred, God did not spare them, rather, he sent them to hell and bound them in chains of gloomy darkness to be kept there until the day of judgment. Peter is making a reference to the days of Noah. Peter understood the historical context of Genesis 6 verses 1 to 4 in the same way that the author of 1 Enoch did. Thank you for watching.